Senator Bono, thank you for speaking with Blue Jersey uh, this morning. Um, during his term, Governor Christie has exercised what appears to be unprecedented unilateral power without con consulting the legislature. Among other actions, the governor has uh, canceled the arc tunnel, pulled out of the regional greenhouse gas initiative, fired the executive director of the Highlands Council, stonewalled on medical marijuana, and initiated a controversial merger of Rowan and Rutgers Camden. If we take the governor's personal style out of the picture for now, does our system of state government put too much power in the hands of the chief executive, or are there significant, sufficient checks and balances on the governor's decision-making process? Well, I think to answer your question directly, I think that it's clear we have the strongest governor uh, in the nation. Uh, we only have that elected office statewide, and now we have a lieutenant governor, but as you know, it's uh, the lieutenant governor's office is given as much power as the governor cedes to it. Um, this governor has taken it to a new height. Uh, I, we have seen him exercise unilateral executive authority uh, that has really been unprecedented. And, and in the process, he has uh, really undone uh, decades of progress that we've made, uh, progress that we've made as a result of forging um, alliances, forging compromise between the political parties, between the branches of government. And I think that it um, indicates, while it may be legal technically, I think it indicates um, antipathy for the uh, legislative branch of government. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that there are going to be longstanding consequences from this. And yet we, we also see that the Republicans in the legislature, with very few exceptions, vote lockstep with the governor's policies. Um, are, are they under the governor's thumb, or do, do they... Is that a rhetorical question? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> it, it, is, it saddens me. It really does, all, all uh, joking aside. You know, the, the, the Senate, uh, prior to this governor coming into an office, was very collegial. We forged an enormous amount of compromise. We uh, made great progress on legislation by uh, uh, talking across the table to one another and um, you know compromising basically that is the essence of a democracy and I don't see much of that going on in Trenton today. So how do we elevate the level of civil discourse in Trenton? You know that's not an easy that's not an easy answer but I'll tell you what I've thought a lot about it I put a lot of thought into it because it does I do find it disturbing and I think ultimately Ultimately, it, all it really serves to do is undermine the public's confidence further in its elected officials. And um, I think, uh, at least for me personally, I try to just uh, treat my colleagues, including the governor, with respect that the office uh, requires, that it, it should demand. And I think that by doing that, you know, we have to lead by example, whether it's uh, uh, the bullying aspect of it or, or not. I think that we should lead by example. And I think the people that elect us deserve representatives who have the courage and the vision to come to a table and to uh, forge compromises. Let, let's go to some specific issues. Um, first of all, the environment. Um, the governor has enabled the bypassing of some environmental regulations in the name of red tape elimination. Uh, Senator Don Adiego has introduced a bill similarly to bypass the Pinelands Commission uh, when it comes to approval of development in, in that area of South Jersey. Has the pendulum swung too far away from protecting our environment? And if so, what, sh what should we do? You know, no question. I think that this governor has, um, as you, you mentioned the Red Tape Review Commission. I have a, a his, bit of a history on that. Uh, the governor appointed me to it. Uh, they, uh, under the guise of eliminating red tape, uh, I, I saw after we had hearings and I saw the report that was drafted uh, that they wanted my fig signature on and I refused to put my signature on it. It just it was clear to me that it was just a lot of anti-government far-right rhetoric and it was designed to undo years of environmental regulations that were really put in place not to thwart business, not to thwart economic development. Economic development and jobs growth is not mutually exclusive with protecting our environment. Uh, they were put in place, those regulations were put in place to protect 
our natural resources, to protect our children, our families, workers. And uh, I see this is um, it's an ongoing uh, pattern that has begun uh, since the governor's first months in office, beginning with the Red Tape Review Commission, which uh, when I wanted to write a minority report, uh, I was essentially just taken off of the report and they issued it as a unanimous report. So that's the kind of thing, it's, you know, my way or the highway. And, you know, we can uh, joke about it and, and uh, people use New, New Jersey as the butt of their jokes, but the fact of the matter is this will have long, long-term consequences for the state of New Jersey, particularly with our environment. One of the things that is plaguing the electoral process today is, is the impact of corporate donations to political campaigns. You're working on a bill to address some of the issues that were brought out by the Citizens United decision. Tell us about that. Yes. Uh, Citizens United, as you know, um, granted corporations the ability to give unlimited amounts of uh, contributions uh, uh, under the First Amendment of the Constitution. Um, unfortunately, uh, that has led to not just unlimited amount of monies, but to anon anonymous uh, givers. In New Jersey, unlike a lot of other states, we do not even require these uh, these 501c3 or c4s and uh, 529s, as they're called under the tax code, to uh, require that they disclose their donors. So the voters of New Jersey are the losers here, because not only is there an unlimited amount of money going uh, to political campaigns, we don't even know who those donors are. They're anonymous donors. And so what my bill would do is it would require, it would still be in uh, keeping with the Citizens United uh, directive, and that is that the donations be unlimited, but it would at least require that these entities file with the elect and disclose those donors because you know we don't know who they are so the voters don't know who who's giving those contributions and there and after that individuals elected what contracts are being given to them for example what legislation is being given in return if it doesn't condone corruption it certainly facilitates it and it gives an appearance of of um, impropriety so this would basically make the voters at least aware of where the money's coming from. Yes, and that's as far as we can go under Citizens United until uh, that's changed. Mm -hmm. According to the Star-Ledger, uh, the administration's revenue projection for this year is the most optimistic among all 50 states, yet our unemployment rate is higher than the national mm -hmm. average, and both the governor's and Senator Sweeney's budgets include significant tax cuts. Is the governor's optimism justified, and what should the legislature do to reach a constitutionally required balanced budget? Well, it's funny you should ask that question because I don't believe that the budget, of course we have to go through budget hearings and as the budget chair for several years uh, I know how important those those hearings are. We have the treasurer come before us and certify the revenues. You get to ask questions and but my feeling is at this point in time that this is not a constitutionally balanced budget that's been presented to the legislature. The governor's um, revenue projections I think are wildly optimistic, improbable if not impossible given the current state of affairs, given the fact that our revenue projections this year are under the revenue projections that we made last year. So uh, I, I'm not quite sure how you can present a budget to the legislature and just because you say it is balanced doesn't make it balanced. So we will, you know, the, the, the legislative budget process is vital and uh, we'll have an opportunity to question the treasurer to an OLS will weigh in on it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think this is just the very beginning of the process. We've got a long way to go over the next few months. Is the millionaire's tax dead given the governor's intransigence on the issue? Not as far as I'm concerned. You know, I know there's been talk over the years. I, Senator Turner has a constitutional amendment uh, that's been filed to place it on the ballot. I think that's something that we should and will be considering and discussing uh, over the course of the next few months. It is dead if we put it in as legislation because the governor will veto it. He's vetoed it twice. Uh, if it is presented as a constitutional amendment, it doesn't have to go to the governor for his signature. So that's something I think we really need to be discussing in earnest in the legislature. Do you think there are enough Republican votes to get the supermajority that's required for a constitutional amendment? No, I don't. But <laughs> that's why I think you know there's another there's a, a more than one way to uh, where there's a will there's a way. And if you pa if you pass the um, the uh, joint resolution uh, in two consecutive years, mm -hmm. all you need is a simple majority. So we it wouldn't it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be on the ballot this year probably. 
Poverty and crime have been a perennial problem for the city of Camden for decades. Uh, much of the state money, I think about $160 million, has gone into the Cooper Hospital and waterfront areas at the expense of the neighborhoods. What can and should be done to help make Camden livable and eventually self-sufficient? Hmm. Well, that's a, certainly a tough question to answer also. I think that um, you can't deny that the fact if you have a vibrant hospital where that it will be, it will create, uh, it will hopefully have an impact on the uh, surrounding neighborhoods. It will therefore create jobs, will bring more people into the city, more people uh, residing in the city, working in the hospital. Uh, so I, uh, I think it's a good thing that uh, Ho Cooper Hospital uh, is um, on the upswing. That uh, I don't necessarily agree with. Um, you know, I have serious concerns being a graduate of Rutgers Camden Law School about the merger. Uh, uh, in the southern part of the state, and I know that there are discussions going on that there may be a middle ground, and I certainly hope so. Many of your constituents were upset when you were removed from the majority leader position. How has this affected your ability to promote progressive legislation? I, mean, I don't think it's it's affected it at all. You know, I've always um, I was elected to support certain policies and principles, and uh, not because I was going to get a certain title. And um, I think that I can be just as effective being, I'm not going to change. I am who I am. I will uh, be a fierce advocate, a passionate advocate, regardless of whether I have a title or not. And uh, so I, I'd like to think that I can be just as effective. Okay. You told NJTV's Mike Schneider that you were seriously considering running for governor in 2013. What are the factors in that consideration, and when do you anticipate coming to a decision? I really, I couldn't go any further than I than I did with Mike Schneider. It's something that you know people ask, and you know you certainly think about it given the direction the state has taken under this governor. Um, back since 2010, when I had my first uh, call to action of progressives in the Tumultees basement, uh, it was really an an alarm that just went off in my head that you know so much was going on under the radar that people just weren't talking about. You know the independence of the judiciary when the when the uh, when the governor refused to reappoint Justice Wallace that was unprecedented in New Jersey. He's really. Uh, impair the independence of the judiciary. Uh, you've already mentioned what the governor's done with respect to environmental regulations, school funding, women's health. The list goes on and on and on. This, the, this governor's failure to uh, put uh, the middle class before millionaires. So all of these factors weigh in on my uh, are weighing in on my decision, and uh, I'll let you know when uh, when I've made it. Okay. Hopefully, you'll give Blue Jersey that scoop. <laughs> Senator Bono, thank you very much. Thanks for having me.